The Reader's Digest Foundation is honored to present the exhibition Journeys to Peace and Cooperation as a gift to the people of China. The story of President Nixon's historic visit in 1972 shows how leaders of great nations can overcome distance and differences to build a more secure future. The short film that follows is a personal memoir of President Nixon's daughter, Julie Nixon Eisenhower. You will see rare private images from the Nixon Library, scenes never before shown anywhere, and you will share Mrs. Eisenhower's own personal account of her parents' experiences in China. Her father believed that mutual respect is the foundation for cooperation among nations. Today, this idea stands as a cornerstone on which we build our hopes for the future. Reader's Digest is proud of its role 30 years ago in encouraging discussion between the United States and the People's Republic. We are pleased to provide our publication in China, and we value our friendship with the Chinese people. It is our sincere wish that new generations of Chinese and American people will enjoy many more decades of peace and cooperation. Thank you. nations will gain from a reduction of tensions and a better relationship between the United States and the People's Republic of China. It is in this spirit that I will undertake what I deeply hope will become a journey for peace. Peace not just for our generation, but for future generations on this earth we share together. When my father, President Nixon, announced that he would visit the People's Republic of China at the invitation of Chairman Mao Zedong, his announcement stunned the world and changed the course of history. Since 1949, there had been no diplomatic relations between the United States and China. But throughout the 60s, my father had been traveling the world and studying the ways our two countries might establish a better relationship for the sake of both our peoples, as well as for the cause of peace and stability in the world. He often said that his greatest dream was to visit China. And when he was elected president, my father immediately began to make his dream a reality. When my parents' journey for peace began on February 17, 1972, my father was exuberant, but he knew there was hard work ahead. During the flight on Air Force One, my father met with his staff and chatted with reporters. Everyone realized that this was a mission that history would remember forever. Shanghai, Shanghai. This is Air Force One, Air Force One calling on... As Air Force One approached Chinese airspace, excitement grew among those on board. My father thought about what he would do when he first met Zhou Enlai. He wanted to emphasize that he came in friendship. So when he went down the steps of Air Force One, he made a point to extend his hand even before his feet touched Chinese soil. That handshake began the week that changed the world. From the moment my parents first arrived in China, they were struck by her sheer vastness and beauty. The broad streets and breathtaking landmarks from the pages of history. They delighted in the warmth of the Chinese people. The faces of the children foretold the future of a great nation. 
The president and first lady had only begun to settle into their guest house in Beijing. When they learned my father had been invited to meet with Chairman Mao Zedong that very day. The meeting was not on the official schedule, but my father was fully prepared. He had carefully studied Mao's life and writings, and he looked forward to meeting the man who had created a new China. Seize the day, seize the hour. These words from Mao's poetry captured perfectly what the leaders of two great nations were doing that afternoon in Beijing. When they met that day, history turned a page. Like millions of Americans, I watched the visit unfold on television, as did many Chinese. Years later, I met a man who told me, "We saw your father and the chairman shake hands. Then your father placed his other hand on top of Mao's, and Mao put his hand on top of your father's." All of us watched this over and over in our village. That night, my father and Zhou Enlai exchanged toasts at a welcoming banquet in the Great Hall of the People. My father quoted Chairman Mao's poetry, while Premier Zhou recalled the lines from President Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. What we say here will not be long remembered. But what we do here will change the world. After the welcoming banquet, my father worked late into the night, making notes from his meetings with Chairman Mao and Premier Zhou. And in the morning, when my father went into meetings, most Americans saw China through my mother's eyes. As the wife of the vice president, and then the president, my mother had traveled to 83 nations around the world. She always felt a strong affinity for the children. She said that even when people shared no common language, they could tell she had love in her heart. It was obvious that friendship flowed both ways as she met China's gracious people. My mother used her time to learn what life was like for the ordinary citizens in China. She visited a farming commune out in the countryside. They're beautiful. She learned about Chinese medicine at a children's hospital, and she learned about Chinese cooking from the chefs at the Beijing Hotel. <laughs> My mother toured the summer palace. There is a pond going up. It's not so easy to climb up properly, so we don't invite you to go up today. <laughs> Well, I'm game. <laughs> she always said she learned a great deal about China from Premier Zhou Enlai. She knew about his years as a revolutionary leader, and now she had a chance to learn about his vision as a peacetime leader and diplomat. During one of their conversations, a small miscommunication took place that later brought joy to countless Americans. My mother commented on the panda bears that decorated packs of cigarettes on the banquet table, and the premier said, "I'll get you some." She assumed he meant some cigarettes, but instead he gave her a pair of live pandas, a generous gift to the people of the United States. Everywhere they went in China, my parents were trailed by a crowd of reporters and photographers, especially when they visited the Great Wall. At dinner the next night, my father talked about his visit to the Great Wall and the work he and the Chinese leaders had undertaken. Yesterday, along with hundreds of millions of viewers on television, we saw what is truly one of the wonders of the world, the Great Wall. As I walked along the wall, I thought of the sacrifices that went into building. I thought of what it showed. About the determination of the Chinese people to retain their independence throughout their long history, I thought about the fact that the wall tells us that China has a great history, and that the people who built this wonder of the world also have a great future. Everywhere he went, my father asked questions to help him better understand China and her people. They toured the Forbidden City. 
once the seat of power of the emperors of China, where a sudden snowfall added to the beauty of the scene. At the Ming tombs, they saw more treasures of ancient China. They drove through the streets of Beijing and Shanghai. And they toured the peaceful gardens around the West Lake in Hangzhou. Although they traveled in an official entourage, my parents also met many Chinese people informally. The children were a particular delight sometimes shy, sometimes fearless, always speaking the universal language of laughter. Can you tell, would you tell the children hello from all the children in, the, in America? As the week in China drew to a close, my father became increasingly intent on the work at hand to forge an agreement that became known as the Shanghai Communique. This unprecedented document would tell the world what China and the United States had accomplished and what remained to be done. Is the Premier happy with the talk? <laughs> it's already has been stated in the communique, hasn't it? I don't have anything more to add to that communique. Both sides stated their positions on the issues that divided them and both sides acknowledged each other's positions. Despite the Cold War, the Shanghai communique showed how nations could live with their differences rather than fighting over them. As my father said then, what brings us together is that we have common interests which transcend our differences. While we cannot close the gulf between us, we can try to bridge that gulf so that we may be able to walk across it. The week that began with a handshake ended with a promise that has lasted 30 years. These principles of mutual respect and restraint remain the basis for the relationship between the United States and China. They continue to guide our two nations on the journey to peace and cooperation.